Now let's go back to Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Glory be his name indeed, the triune God of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And blessed be the Son of God who is God in the flesh, the Father's beloved Son. Let's read 22, 23 again. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be, shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. <clears throat> And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Notice, when Mary conceived as a virgin without sexual intercourse by the power of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to Christ as a virgin, she fulfilled the prophecy that says that Emmanuel would be born. Now Matthew, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says Emmanuel means God with us. Now, this can mean one of two things. <clears throat> It can mean that Jesus' Jesus's birth is a sign that the God of heaven is with his people. Not that Jesus is God, but that Jesus' birth is a sign that the God of heaven is with his people and sent the Messiah. Or it can mean that Jesus himself is God with us. Which interpretation fits the context of Matthew? Is Matthew saying that Jesus himself is God with us? Or is Matthew saying that Jesus is a sign that the God in heaven who's separate from Jesus, happens to be with us. Which interpretation fits the context and how do we know? Carol, you'd be right in that the God of heaven, the Father, is with us and Jesus is also God with us because the Father, Son, and Spirit, all three of them happen to be with us. But how do we know that this also applies to Jesus? That it's saying that Jesus is God with us. How do we know that? <clears throat> Someone can say, well, no, you're a Trinitarian, and you want it to mean that. But it's clear that Matthew is saying, no, the God of heaven is someone separate from Jesus. And by sending Jesus, the God of heaven is giving proof to his people that he's present with them. Not that Jesus is God. Now, how do we refute that? Well, you got it, Carol. Well, number one, we were already told in Matthew 1.21 that Jesus is Yahweh who saves. Because he saves his people from their sins. For him to do that, he must be Yahweh God. That's the first argument. Excellent, Carol. 121 tells you that Jesus is the God who saves people from their sins. So obviously he must be God who has come to dwell with us. The second line of evidence is the following. Remember this word, saints. Well, let me go on, sorry. Not because I'm boring you. I'm boring myself. No, here's a second, second line of evidence that shows that Jesus himself is God with us. Remember this word, inclusio. Inclusio is a fancy term that has been coined, that you know people have coined to describe a literary feature known as the bookend. Inclusio is basically a bookend, right? A literary feature that authors use in their writing by reiterating, repeating a point that he made at the start of his book. Does everyone understand what an Inclusio bookend is? Peace forever and everyone else. you got to get this. If you get this, you're going to be finding this feature all throughout the Bible. The author ends his particular writing by reiterating, repeating a theme or a point that he made at the start of his writing. Everyone with me? A book end. Does everyone understand what that is? I need to hear ones. If there's anyone confused, put a two. Is there any twos in the house? Now, nearly all of you have heard this in the past, so you already know this, right? But I'm repeating it for people like Peace who may have not have heard this before. Okay, now that you know what a bookend is, let's compare Matthew 1.23 with Matthew 28.20. Matthew 28.20. Carol, can you post Matthew 1.23 and Matthew 28.20? Now put Matthew 28.20 right, right next to it, back to back. Here's a bookend. Matthew ends the gospel by reiterating the point he made at the beginning of it. Do you guys catch it? See if you catch it. Notice the last verse of the gospel reiterates what he said at the beginning of his gospel. When Mary gave birth to the child, that fulfilled the prophecy that Emmanuel is here. Who is Emmanuel? God with us. How does Jesus end the gospel of Matthew? Notice what Jesus says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
and lo, I am with you always. Do you see it? Even unto the end of the world, amen. The gospel ends by Jesus affirming that he remains with us, even though physically he's not present, physically he's absent, but still as God, he remains with us to the end of the world. You catch it? Matthew starts by saying that Jesus is God with us. Matthew ends the gospel by Jesus promising to continue to be with us to the end of the world. So then, who is the God that came to dwell with us and remains with us to the end of the age? According to Matthew, who is that God? Who is that God? Okay, now you understand the significance of this, right? You understand the significance of, uh, of this, right? What attributes must Jesus have to be spiritually present, truly present, not in a physical way, because he's not physically with us, truly present at no matter how many till the end of the age, guaranteeing their success in accomplishing his will and making disciples of all nations. Because in this context, he's telling them, look, go out throughout the world to make disciples and don't be afraid. I'm with you. In other words, he's reassuring them they'll be successful. Don't be afraid. What kind of qualities, what kind of attributes must Jesus have in order to be with all his followers, wherever they're at, at the same time, guaranteeing the success of their mission? Yep, you said it. Omnipresent is one. But he's also guaranteeing that because he's with them, they will succeed. No power will thwart them and prevent them from accomplishing his will. You got it, Carol. He also must be omnipotent. Do you catch it? By claiming to be with all his disciples all over the world, to reassure them that they'll be successful in accomplishing his mission, Jesus must be omnipresent, omnipotent. However, how many beings are omnipotent and omnipresent? Are creatures all powerful present everywhere? No. Only God is omnipotent, omnipresent. By claiming to be omnipotent, omnipresent, Jesus is making himself out to be who? Who is Jesus basically claiming to be? You got it. But now let's go back to Matthew 23. When it says that the virgin-born son of Mary fulfills Isaiah 7.14, the prophet says that Emmanuel has come, and Emmanuel means God with us. Is Matthew saying that Jesus himself is the God who has come to be with us? In light of the bookend in Matthew 28.20, 20, doesn't Matthew 1.23 affirm that according to Matthew, Jesus himself is God who has come to be with us? So the name Emmanuel means that Jesus is God Almighty that has come to dwell with us. Isn't that clear that's what Matthew is doing? Emmanuel is Jesus, who is God, that has come to dwell with us. Clear as day? But you know why that's important? You don't see it in English. In the Greek, it doesn't say God with us. It says, Ha Theos, the God, the God has come to dwell with us. Are you aware of it? So it doesn't simply say God has come. It says, Ha Theos, the God, the one and only God has come. Notice Matthew 1.23, Jesus is given one of the names of God. Which name? He's called Ha Theos, the God, the one and only God has come to dwell with us. Do you see it? So not only does Jesus possess the attributes of God, Right? In that he is omnipresent and omnipotent. Jesus also Jesus also possesses the names of God. Right? In that he is called Ha Theos, meaning the God. Everyone with me? Now I'm gonna give you the link to prove this, okay? I'm gonna give you a link so you can read it on your own so you can see. One second. Let me get it for you. Peace and Chris and everyone, do you see it? According to Matthew 1, 23, Jesus is the God. Ha Theos. Not simply God, 
the God. You can use this to refute the Jehovah's Witnesses who claim that Jesus is a God, but not the God. You with me? Okay, now, those of you who are listening and putting ones, go here. Go to that interlinear Greek New Testament and go all the way down to Matthew 123, okay? Look at Matthew 123, okay? This is what you're going to find, Matthew 123. If you look at the Greek, above it, let me see if it's above it, you have the Greek letters, and above it, you have the English transliteration of the Greek. This is what you're going to find, okay? You ready? Meth hemon ha theos. This is what you're going to see. I want everyone to go there. Actually, it's ha theos. I'm sorry. I, I thought they didn't put the H. Okay, let me do it again. I want everyone to go there to Matthew 123 and tell me if you see those words. You'll see the Greek letters, and above it, the English transliteration of the Greek. The Greek word spelled with English letters. When you do that, please let me know if you see those words. Meth, hemon, patheos. Okay? Let me know. Put a one where you see it. <clears throat> Meth. Soldier of Christ, you saw it, right? Good. Waiting for the rest of you. Good. Praise the Lord. Carol, you're seeing it. Excellent. Peace, you saw it? Glory to God. Amen. You're seeing it too? Okay, you saw it, right? Okay, what does meth hemon ha theos mean? Literally, with us, the God. Meth, with, right? Hemon, plural, us, ha, the, and then theos, God. Does everyone see that in the Greek New Testament, which the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to write, Jesus is called ha Theos, the God, not simply God. Does everyone see it? Do you guys see it? Peace. I hope this blesses you that you're seeing that here the angel tells Joseph that Jesus is Jehovah who saves and he'll save his people from their sins. And then Matthew by inspiration says that Jesus is the God, God Almighty who has come to dwell with us. And then Matthew ends his gospel by Jesus affirming to be the God who will remain with us to the end of the age. Isaiah 7.14 doesn't translate the name. Isaiah 7.14, from which the prophecy comes, says Emmanuel. But Isaiah doesn't translate Emmanuel. Matthew is translating Emmanuel in Greek. Matthew wrote in Greek, Isaiah never translated Emmanuel for us. But Emmanuel, right? Emmanuel right, would be with us, and then L is simply the word God, right? It doesn't say Emanu Ha-El, Ha meaning the L, God. But that's beside the point. When Matthew in Greek translates the meaning of annual, he chooses to use the word Ha-Theos. Now Matthew didn't have to word, use the word Ha-Theos, the God. He could have simply said Theos is with us, right? Matthew could have said meth, hemon, theos, correct? Drop the definite article, which would have meant with us, God, correct? But Matthew didn't do that. He did meth, hemon, and by the way, excuse my butchering of the Greek, right? Meth, hemon, ha, theos, right? Actually, you have places where L does have the definite article preceding it. You have ha, L. Ha Elohim. So that's not true, apologist. I'm not talking about names in which the divine name forms part of a person's name. I'm talking about in Hebrew itself, you have Ha El. Matthew translates the meaning of Emmanuel in Greek. He didn't have to say Ha Theos. He could have said Meth Hemon Theos. The definite article was not required. It is, apologists. I know that because I wrote a response to a Muslim who tried to argue that Allah is identical to Elohim and El. And I said, no. You know why? Because Allah is a contraction of two words. Let me just real quickly, because this is relevant to the topic. El 
Ilah, right? Which means the God. In time, an Ilah became contracted as Allah. Now, I told them in order for Allah to correspond to one of God's Hebrew names, it wouldn't con correspond to Elohim or El or Eloah because these names do not contain the definite article. If Allah was to correspond to one of God's names, then it would have to correspond to Ha Elohim, right? Ha El, Ha Eloah, but not simply Elohim. Not simply El, not simply Eloah. Why? Because Allah is two words contracted. El, the definite article the, and Ilah. It's the word Ilah that would correspond, Ilah that would correspond to Elohim, right? El or Eloh or Eloah. You with me? So that's how I know that in Hebrew you can place a definite article before the words El, Elohim, Eloah. Thank you, flashlight. Lord bless you, flashlight. That shows that you know the languages. So praise God. I'm no expert in languages, I'm a student of the languages, so praise the Lord. Lord bless you and use you mightily. Not to lose the point, but good good point, apologist. Okay. Now, Chris, do you see, and peace, and everyone else, right? Do you see that according to Matthew 1.23, Jesus is not simply Theos, he's Ha Theos, the God, God Almighty. Is that clear? And do you see that Jesus claims to be omnipresent, omnipotent? Notice again, according to Matthew and according to the words of Christ, Jesus possesses the attributes of God and the names of God. He's called Ha Theos, the God, and he's omnipresent, omnipotent, attributes that belong to God alone. And in Matthew 121, he is Jehovah that saves. He saves his people from their sins, something that only Jehovah does according to the Old Testament. I mean, could Matthew be any clearer that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh? Could Revelation be any clearer that Jesus is uncreated, eternal, beginningless, and therefore God in the flesh? Could they be any clearer? Those of you who have been following me thus far, is it clear that according to Matthew 1 and Matthew 28, Jesus is Jehovah, the God, the God of heaven, Jehovah who comes to dwell with us and save his people from their sins? Names and attributes that the Old Testament ascribed to God alone. Was that clear? And peace, was that clear for you too? Okay, now, and I think the information I gave you will be a blessing by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Lord forgive me for making any mistakes. I pray I made none. If I did, may he protect you from it, and the Lord correct me and bring it to my recollection where I made a mistake, to repent of it and never repeat it in Jesus' name. Because everything good is from Him, everything imperfect is from us. Let's look at one more, Philippians 2, 9-11. All right, read with me, guys. Philippians two nine to eleven. Peace and everyone else. Peace and everyone else. Read with me. Let's read Philippians two nine eleven. <clears throat> Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Now pay attention to this part. At the name of Jesus, this echoes Revelation 5.13. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and echo Revelation 5.13 and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let me show you what Paul did here. What I want you to do is pay attention to the words every knee should bow. Every knee should bow. And if you have a Bible in your hand, underline that or highlight it. And I want you to underline or highlight every tongue confess, okay, should confess. Every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. Now notice, Paul says this has to happen. Either it happens voluntarily, we do it now and be saved, or we'll be forced to do it whether we like or not when Christ comes. A time will come where everyone, whether they like or not, must bow and confess Jesus. So let's do it now and start liking it now, because if we do it now, we will be saved. If we're forced to do it on the Day of Judgment, it will be too late. Because we'll be forced to do it 
as we're sent on our merry way to hell. Because whether you like it or not, all creation has to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. This is something that God expects. So glory to God, the day will come, we'll see all false prophets, especially Muhammad, being forced to bow the knee before the feet of Jesus and confessing Jesus as Lord, but it'll be too late for them. In Jesus' name, we do it now gladly, because we love Jesus and He is Lord. Now, with that said, with that said, every knee should bow, every tongue confess. Let's look at Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23, and see what Paul did. Remember, Paul was a zealous Jew. He was a Jewish scholar, zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And he himself says, as far as the law is concerned, I was blameless. But he counts that all rubbish for the glory of Christ. So he knew his Bible. Paul was a scholar of the Jewish Bible, so he knew what he was doing here. Notice what this, what Isaiah 45, a monotheistic passage, affirming that only God is truly God, only God is the Savior, and only God is worthy of worship. Notice what he does with that passage. <clears throat> In Philippians 2, let's read it. Isaiah 45, 21, 23. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, meaning Jehovah? There is no God else beside me. Notice, he's trying to prove to the world, not just Israel, no other God exists but I. I alone am God, says Jehovah, and here's the proof. He's going to predict the future. The future will happen exactly as he said, as proof that he alone is God. <clears throat> now, why would God do that? Why would God predict the future and make sure the future happens exactly according to his word? Well, here's the reason why. He wants to give proof to all mankind that he alone is the Savior, so that mankind turns to him alone for salvation. God loves the entire world, loves all mankind, that he wants all of them to realize that he is their only hope of salvation. So he's giving them proof, leaving them with no excuse, right, to believe in other gods. Because he's going to do what only he can do and no other god can do, tell the future and bring it to pass, to give them irrefutable evidence that he alone is God, worthy of worship. That's the context. Does everyone understand the context now? Why is God doing this? Right? Do you understand the context now? Why God is appealing to fulfill prophecy, predictions? He's doing this to convince the nations that their gods are not gods. He alone is God. Why does he want to convince them of that? Because he wants them to turn to him and be saved. Let's read it. There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. See, this is the reason. All you ends of the earth, look to me to be saved. For I am God, and there is none else. Now notice this. Only Jehovah is God. Only He can save. And everyone must turn to Him alone to be saved, right? Now watch 23. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me, me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Sound familiar? Let's look at Philippians 2, 10 to 11 again. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, not just the earth. Paul takes, actually expands it. Everywhere, not just the earth. Isaiah said everyone on the earth has to bow and swear by Jehovah. Paul takes that and expands it, not just on the earth, in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth, and every tongue confess, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you see what Paul did with this passage? And Paul knew what he was doing. Do you see what Paul did? Paul was a monotheistic Jew, saturated in the Old Testament. He knew this passage, but do you see what he did with this passage? Peace forever, Chris and everyone else. Do you see what he did with Isaiah 45? A passage that says, Jehovah alone is God, <clears throat> Jehovah alone is Savior, and everyone throughout the earth must bow to Him and swear by Him and confess Him. Paul takes that passage and says that God has decreed that every knee should bow everywhere, in heaven, in earth, under the earth. Every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see what he did? How could Paul take a passage 
which speaks of Jehovah alone being God, He alone being Savior, and He alone must be worshipped and confessed and acknowledged for salvation, takes such a passage and applies it to the worship and the glory that everyone must give to Christ an acknowledgement that He is Lord whom the Father has glorified. How could He do that if Jesus is not Jehovah? Can someone tell me? Yes, he hated Christians for that very reason, because he thought Christians were blaspheming by worshipping a creature as the Creator. Then he learned later that this was no creature. This creature was actually Jehovah who became man for his redemption. And that's why he joined them in their worship of Jesus. Do you see that Paul says, Jesus receives the very worship that God alone receives, right? Right? So that means... Under this acronym, hands, this falls under what category? What category would this fall under? Someone tell me. H, right? Why H? Why H? Here's why. You guys got it. Honors. Jesus receives the very honor which God alone is supposed to receive. Because Paul takes a passage that talks about the worship that is to be given to God alone and applies it to Jesus Christ. Is that clear? Is that clear that Jesus is being worshipped the way God is supposed to be worshipped? And everyone must worship Jesus eventually the way God is supposed to be worshipped? This also falls under S, the seed of God. But I'll expand on that a little later.